Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on money and the democratization of payments. As the Sir John Lubbock Chair in Banking Law and Head of the Banking and Finance Institute, let me thank you all, our highly esteemed alumni from around the world, first for having chosen Queen Mary University of London and CCLS as a place to study today, one of your alma mater, if not your alma mater, and also for enthusiastically endorsing our event today through your registration. I will commence by saying a few words about CCLS and the speaker, Professor Sir William Blair. The Center for Commercial Law Studies celebrates this month of June its 40th anniversary. CCLS was established by Professor C. Roy Good in 1980 to create an environment where practicing commercial lawyers and those from academia, government and social society could, civil society, could meet and exchange ideas. Let me now briefly introduce our very distinguished speaker today, which is known to many of you since he has taught a few of you in his lectures at CCLS. Sir William Blair is Professor of Financial Law and Ethics at CCLS. Uh, prior to joining Queen Mary, he served as a High Court Judge in England and Wales for nearly 10 years and was the judge in charge of the Commercial Court from 2016 till he retired from the court. Since 2017, he rejoined three Berulam buildings as an associate member having previously practiced as a commercial QC before his appointment to the bench. He helped to establish the specialist financial list, understanding international financial, international forum of commercial courts. He's also the chairman of MOCOMILA, the Monetary Committee of the International Law Association, where I have the pleasure and the privilege of also being a member. He has been president of the Board of Appeals of the European Supervisory Authorities, till 2020. In 2018, he was appointed chair of the Bank of England's Enforcement Decision-Making Committee. He also sits an, as an arbitrator and he chairs the Law and Ethics in Finance project, which is an informal group concerned with raising standards in the financial sector. His current research, uh, his interests, many of them are aligned with my own, include fintech, financial crime, and financial inclusion, themes which will feature in the presentation of today. He has also an interest in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and he has served on missions from the World Bank, the IMF, and the Asian Development Bank. He has a very long and illustrious career, but we are here today to listen to him and not to listen to his many achievements. So before I pass the word on to him, let me say a few logistical issues or words about the webinar. The session, which just started now at one o'clock, three minutes ago, will last until 1.10, 10 past one UK time. After Bill's presentation, after Sir William Blair's presentation, I will make a very brief commentary, and then I will open the floor to Q&A, questions and answers. As I say in every webinar in which I take part recently or in the last few weeks, we now live in Zoom land. And all of us have become familiar with the chat room feature that allows you to put questions, in this case, to Professor Blair. Questions which I will moderate and try to get to him as many as possible during the time that we have been allocated for this webinar. And with that, I will pass the word on to Sir William Blair, asking him to share with us the screen. I know Carlos Cavallo will be uh, projecting the slides that uh, Sir William Blair will be talking to and will be giving the appropriate thanks as he does so. So, Bill, my friend, Sir William Blair, our distinguished speaker, the floor is all yours. Well, Rosa, um, thank you very much, uh, and it's a, a real honour and a real pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to give this lecture on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of CCLS. 
uh, do you mind if I begin with a very practical question, which is quite important on these occasions, and that is, uh, can can you hear me and can you see me? And uh, a, a nod will be sufficient if you can. You can maybe speak a little higher, Bill, maybe by putting that closer to you. That's right, yes. So just one uh, uh, point, if I may, to um, uh, uh, correct. The uh, seminar will, of course, uh, end at... Uh, uh, 10 minutes past two, not 10 minutes past one. And uh, my, my, my remarks will take about half an hour. But uh, before uh, I begin, uh, let me just say this, that um, my relationship with uh, the Center for Commercial Law Studies does go back pretty much to its foundation. And uh, some of you I know on this lecture will remember the extraordinary work that was done by Professor Sir Roy Good, which we all benefit from to this day. I'm very proud of my relationship with the center and I'm very proud of the continuing work that it's doing. Um, when I saw the uh, list of people who are attending the lecture, I was really pleased to see names that I recognized, including uh, names of uh, past and present uh, uh, students. Let me also say this, that I, I know that some of you, um, perhaps here in London, perhaps in uh, different countries around the world, will be studying at the moment in these unusual conditions of lockdown and uh, trying to um, make things work remotely. And uh, um, you, you've, you've done a fantastic job as a student body. We're very, very proud of you. Um, and uh, uh, I think we're all just beginning to learn some of the um, uh, uh, issues that this uh, pandemic is bringing with us. But my um, remarks uh, today are on a more narrow subject, of course, and that is the um, uh, law of money. And uh, there'll be some slides. And let, let me uh, thank uh, Clara Barbiani, who uh, kindly prepared these slides. But let me, uh, as, a, um, as a speaker, uh, put some questions to you and ask you to bear these in mind as we go through over the next half hour or so. So what do we mean by money? Is it different from payment? We all know that money's revolutionized the global economy and that the pace of change is speeding up. But when it comes to money, does that fundamentally change anything? Or is it simply reflected in the way that we make payments? Money has always been a source of power. Are we about to see that reordered in the 21st century? And what are the consequences of money and particularly payments becoming a source of information? We leave a lifelong trail behind us which never existed in the past. In China, at the time of Lunar New Year, Red packets containing lucky money are traditionally handed out to friends and family. Can such a venerable practice going back many, many centuries be transformed by technology? Certainly it can. In recent years, it's been estimated that over 750 million people sent out red packets in digital form using WeChat, which is currently the most popular messaging app in China. New Year 2020 has been disfigured by the coronavirus pandemic, surely one of the most extraordinary events in contemporary history. What effects will the pandemic have in the world of money? Could we see a privatized global currency? Or will the effect be to consolidate money back into international silos? At present, money creation is happening on an unprecedented scale with quantitative easing and in some countries, including the UK, monetary financing, in other words, direct financing by the, of the government by way of overdraft extended by the central bank. Does this mean that money is losing its nature as such? But I would like to start at a more human level. Red packets, tell us about an important aspect of money. 
apart from its economic role, money is a social institution. And let me quote some words, words from the IMF. Economists beware. Payments are not just an act of extinguishing a debt. They are an exchange, an interaction between people, a fundamentally social experience. If two people use the same payment method, a third is more likely to join. And they went on to say, and uh, it's not usual for uh, international money, monetary funds to put things quite this way, but money, uh, payments can be more fun in e-money since messages and photos can't be sent with a credit card payment. As well as the obvious drivers of the payments revolution, therefore, such as convenience and low transaction costs, another is the social aspect. From red packets, to getting on the metro, to buying a cup of coffee, payment by phone is increasingly part of the experience. Bill splitting apps allow people to eat as a group without arguing about the bill afterwards. And the same technology is available for other social activities such as flat sharing and traveling. Because it is so widely available to people in the developing as much as the developed world, the payments revolution can be seen as a kind of democratization of money, empowering anyone with access to mobile technology. At the same time, the flood of data attached to new forms of payments gives rise to issues as to protection, misuse, and the possibility of harm to humans, which has never been associated with money in the same way before. The massive increase in connectivity which underpins the payments revolution, also leads to concerns that we could be entering into the age of surveillance. Let me turn to money and its categorization. Characteristically, money in contemporary times is fiat money. In other words, money that is backed by the resources of a state. Fiat is a Latin word roughly translated as let it be done. We tend to take fiat money for granted, but its dominance is surprisingly recent. Right up to 1971, the US dollar was backed by gold under the Bretton Woods system agreed in 1944. The fact that money was issued in paper banknotes tended to obscure the fact that the metallic nature of currency, going back to ancient times in Mesopotamia, continued in the form of the gold standard. Bretton Woods worked for a time, not least because by the end of the Second World War, the United States held about three quarters of the world's official gold reserves. But a run on gold eventually put an end to the system. So when we talk about fiat money, we're talking about banknotes. With some exceptions, the Eurozone being one, National central banks are the issuers of fiat money. For a long time, however, banknotes have constituted a declining part of the total money in circulation. During the 19th century, the rise of commercial banks and saving institutions with reliable and accessible statements of account and the development of reliable payment systems such as check clearing resulted in the bulk of money consisting of entries in bank accounts. So some statistics. It has been estimated that 97% that of all circulating money is bank money. And now this is in electronic form, of course, reflecting the way in which accounts are kept. The decline of cash in favor of e-money in one form or another is very marked in the UK. Cash as a percentage of all payments was down by 60% in 2008, down to 28% in 2018, and is projected to be 9% by 2028. And those statistics leave out the effect of the pandemic. Perhaps a more revealing statistic is that during 2018, 
there were 5.4 million consumers who almost never used cash at all, instead relying on cards and other payment methods to manage their spending. This was an increase from 3.4 million consumers the previous year. These trends are likely to be accentuated by the pandemic. Similarly, global banks like Monzo and Starling and apps like Revol Revolut, which simplify payments in foreign currency, are making intro inroads into the tra traditional bank's consumer bases. But, and here's an important point, it seems unlikely that physical cash will ever disappear. And there are policy reasons for avoiding that. The risk of systems failure is an obvious one. Another, and taking statistics from the UK again, around 12% of adults in the UK result from so-called digital exclusion. I think it's good to say this in an ac academic context. We shouldn't assume that this is a legacy problem because the technology changes. What is routine for mill millennials now may look different as their own age pro profile changes. This will be one of the challenges of technology. But however sophisticated these payment systems have become, so far they have not changed the concept of money since they deal in fiat money. So, so let me now um, turn to payment systems and I want to begin with China. In its highly developed smartphone payment system, the linkage of, to the financial system of the two main players, that is Alipay and WeChat Pay, is typically through bank accounts. Credit card usage is much less than in the West. However, there is a significant difference between these providers and, for example, Visa and MasterCard in the West. These have their roots in the banking system, but Alipay and WeChat Pay come from technology companies, Al Alibaba and Tencent, respectively. This blurring of the boundaries between technology and finance looks like becoming a global trend with structural implications for the whole global financial services industry. Both Alipay and WeChat Pay now have systems that allow customers to make payments in retail stores by simply scanning their faces, bypassing even the phone. Given the growing pay pace of facial recognition, how long will it realistically be before the human face takes the place of cash, card, or phone? The risks here are not principally monetary, but go to data protection, identity theft, illicit data you, you linkages, and other potential abuses. Despite these risks, experience suggests that the public tends to look first to convenience. And of course, the technology now has an impetus of its own. Now I'm going to turn to the development of private currencies. And um, let, let me begin by saying this, that uh, when it comes to currency, some people maintain that payment in fiat currency is the best and perhaps the only feasible medium to fulfill the, cle the three classic functions of money. And for those of you who've studied the, uh, the economics of money, the law and economics agree about this. These three classic functions are money as a unit of account, money as a store of value, and money as a means of exchange or payment. But is this belief correct? One person who would not share it is Satoshi Nakatomo. The story is very well known. Nakamoto identified what he, if it is a he since it's a pseudonym, described as the inherent weakness of the, I'm quoting, trust-based model reliant on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. His solution, which was an extraordinarily ingenious one, 
was an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust. The software, I think as many people here will know well, encrypts each transaction, but a public record of every coin's movement is published across the entire network. Whereas in a conventional system, there is a single ledger, Bitcoin uses an open decentralized ledger that records transactions in a permanent way without needing third-party authentication. This has, of course, become known as dig uh, distributed ledger technology or more, more colloquially, blockchain. Now, I want to turn next to the treatment of money in the law. In keeping with its character as a system developed by judges over time, common law has attempted to avoid overarching definitions of money, considering questions as to the nature of money in context, that context being particularly in relation to payment. There is an exception, and that is the Uniform Commercial Code of the United States, and that adopts a, a fiat theory, providing that money means that which is issued as a state as such. However, it's worth bearing in mind that the UCC was drafted in the early 50s, and of course the technology um, surrounding money that we're familiar with today and as part of the subject of this lecture didn't exist at that time. So some cases and uh, the most famous case of all is the oldest case of all so far as the common law is concerned and uh, that arises out of the uh, debasement in the time of Queen Elizabeth, the first that is not the second, of the silver coins of the Irish currency in connection with the war that she was waging in Ireland at the beginning of the 17th century, deciding against an English merchant in 1604, the court decided that he had to accept payment in the debased currency because it was the lawful currency in the place of payment, which was Ireland. So you see immediately that this case distinguished between the intrinsic value of the silver currency and its extrinsic value by reference to its denomination. This is the principle of monetary nom nominalism. The conclusion may seem obvious to us, but it cannot have been obvious at a time when money was measured by reference to precious metals. However, that case, so far as the common law is concerned, laid the foundations for what we have today, which is a monetary economy. With the emergence of banknotes in the 18th century, a development in some ways more profound conceptually than that of e-money, the courts had to decide on the legal status of these banknotes. A Bank of England banknote being sent through the mail in payment of a debt was stolen in a stagecoach robbery, and it ended up in the hands of an innkeeper who had taken it without notice of the robbery. Try to apply our um, legal understanding to the uh, issues that this raised. If someone steals my car and you buy it from a thief, I'm entitled to have it back, even if you bought it in good faith. The court had to decide whether this would apply where a person was robbed or defrauded of a banknote. And this raises a basic question as to the nature of money. Citing the needs of commerce, the court found for the innkeeper holding banknotes as negotiable so that property passes to someone taking them for value in good faith. These are old cases, but they give an indication of how new money-like instruments would be treated in the law now. If the evidence establishes that something is treated as money, the courts should be prepared to accept it as money. Applying the same principle, other cases show how money can cease to be such. An example is the treatment of collector's items, such as banknotes from vanished re regimes, such as Tsarist Russia. In such cases, of course, value and, value and denomination are decoupled entirely, and they are no longer money. So those are some of the legal principles that have been established over time. 
And with those in mind, how do new forms of, in of instruments measure up so far as the law is concerned? Crypto assets are not limited to cryptocurrencies, but have had a fairly modest uptake in, for example, share issues. However, cryptocurrencies are by far the most common of this type of asset. The fundamental reason why Bitcoin and most similar instruments are unlikely at present to be treated as money, let alone a private global currency, is first, that the technology is presently slow and clunky, prepared with conventional payment systems, and second, that the assets are too volatile to have a widespread use as a means of payments. So although Nakamoto set out to create an alternative payment system, what was in fact created in Bitcoin was a highly volatile and speculative investment. What is the position as regards crypto as property? In 2015, a case arising out of the collapse of Mount Gox Exchange, the Tokyo District Court held that Bitcoin lacked the necessary corporeality to be considered as property under the civil code. And, and that um, finding by the Tokyo Court may resonate with some of the um, uh, civil lawyers who are um, uh, with us on this lecture. However, so far as the common law is concerned, it's likely that crypto assets will be treated as property despite some potentially difficult questions relating to bankruptcy, beneficial ownership, and the ledger itself, what, a, a le what legal status that ledger has. This is the conclusion reached in Singapore in a case called B2C2 v Coin in 2019. The same conclusion has been reached in November 2019 by the UK Jurisdiction Task Force and applied by the London Commercial Court in granting an injunction against persons unknown to whom the crypto, which was Bitcoin, had been transferred by, pay, by way of payment. And here's a point about this case that uh, is um, uh, worth mentioning. The payment was made by an insurance company by way of ransom to get its uh, IT systems freed up. And that is certainly uh, a sign of the kind of times in which we're going to have to uh, look at um, these legal questions that were uh, addressed in the past. The next um, issue I want to turn to is Facebook's Libra. A, a lot of you will have come across this and uh, many of you will know quite a lot about it. The coin called Libra is still at the planning stage and uh, I think as we, we all know has faced major opposition from the authorities in certain key countries. In short, it created a Ferrari. There are two main characteristics of Libra as, Libra as originally conceived, which make it so far unique. First and most important, the key attribute is the messaging system rather than the coin. And again, some statistics. It's been reported that the latest messaging app shows that WhatsApp, which of course is owned by Facebook, has 1.6 billion users worldwide and Facebook Messenger has 1.3 billion. Compare that with WeChat with about 1 billion, mainly in China. Just over the last few days, Facebook announced a WhatsApp payment figure, a payment feature in Brazil it's seeming likely that Mexico, Indonesia, and India will follow soon if that's successful. And by the way, there's no reason to suppose that it won't be. And here's the point I think for the, um, the new age that we need to, to think about carefully. And it's Mark Zuckerberg's statement that sending money should be as easy as sharing photos. And just think for a moment what that um, 
means to the uh, many many workers the, the world over who find it sometimes quite difficult to get money back to their families or who end up paying quite a lot of, a lot of money to um, tra uh, transfer services. It is an immensely powerful message and it resonates with a global audience which is looking to technology for simple and accessible outcomes. The second point, and this is equally revolutionary, as originally conceived, Libra would be backed by a reserve in five major currencies, the US dollar, euros, yen, sterling, and Swiss francs. So you can immediately see that the user is able to pay for and redeem Libra in their own currency. But the value of Libra will always be determined by the weighted value of the five currencies. So Facebook has emphasized the advantages for financial inclusion, as I've just said. If that proposal goes ahead in this form, then Libra's stated ambition to become a global currency would be complete. And the way would be open for the common law to recognize the currency as money on the principles that I've stated. And there's another point here, which is important to bear in mind, and it's this. The possibility arises for Libra to be more than a payment system. Why do I say that? This is because users may prefer, the, prefer to leave the funds in a more secure environment than their own financial systems. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the um, opposition that Libra gave rise to. And in April 2020, without abandoning the original idea, Facebook produced a variation of it. This would see the launch of a series of different digital coins, each backed by a different fiat currency. Coins of this kind are sometimes described as stable coins. Reason, because they lack the kind of volatility that, volatility that Bitcoin has the value of which is dependent entirely by uh, supply and demand. Despite the many legitimate concerns about Libra around financial stability and data misuse uh, and the obvious need for uh, comprehensive regulation, the objections to Libra probably stem largely from the implications of this project. The US dollar is presently close to a global currency in both its bank and physical cash form and is the number one reserve currency, of course. And with that, as we all know, comes immense economic and geopolitical soft power. But for any country, not just the United States, the possibility of the state losing its present de facto monopoly on currency issuance to a fang is not a great prospect. Nevertheless, it has to be accepted that the record of states in managing their currencies is patchy. Well, we have, of course, the, uh, many examples. Um, the, hy uh, the hyperinflation in Zimbabwe resulted in the state currency being effectively demonetized between 2019 with the US dollar and the South African rand becoming legal tender. But here's the point. Libra has now been invented. The blue paid, the uh, blueprint is there. The cat is out of the bag. It's been demonstrated that a private global currency is attainable by an entity with sufficient, sufficient technological firepower. And my view is that that cat will be difficult to get back into the bag without addressing the financial inclusion ideals that Libra seeks to ameliorate. It may be impossible. Now I want to turn to central bank digital currencies. This is another really important part of the monetary scene as it's developing at this time, very much at this time. 
So given our day-to-day -day experiences with cashless payments, it may seem counterintuitive that central banks are only now considering issuing digital currencies. But digital currency in this context has a specific meaning, applying to money to which business or the public generally, and not just the banking system, has direct access. access. In other words, just as in the case of banknotes. A number of central banks have been considering issuing digital currencies. Progress has been slow. Part of the reason for this is that national payment systems are, are already perceived to work adequately or well. Um, thinking now of payment systems in many parts of the world, uh, including here in the UK. If a central bank issues a digital currency, then in principle, everyone and every business could not only make payments in electronic central bank money, but could store value in electronic central bank money. The IMF has pointed out that offering fully fledged CBDC would require a central bank to be active along several steps of the payment chain, potentially including interfacing with customers, building front end wallets, maintaining technology, monitoring transactions, and very important given the experience with Bitcoin, being responsible for anti-money laundering. The People's Bank of China, which is China's central bank, has been at the forefront of these developments. It has been reported that there have been trials of ERMB or digital yuan in various cities. A professor, of, a, PK, a professor at PKU has reported as commenting, although there is little change from the perspective of user use, from the perspective of central bank supervision, future forms of finance, payment, business, and social governance, etc. This is the biggest thing ever. Besides these factors, China sees its digital currency as safeguarding its currency sovereignty and promoting the RMB beyond its borders. The emphasis is on self-reliance, countering the financial and technical dominance of the US, and ultimately seeing the RMB as a principal global reserve currency. Let me now move on to uh, another idea, which I'm going to touch on very quickly. It was made by uh, Mark Carney, in a, the governor of the Bank of England at the time, in a speech in 2019. And what he was basically saying is that all the um, digital currencies should be brought together in a, a synthetic uh, currency. And it's quite striking the language he used. He said the purpose would be to um, dampen the domineering influence of the US dollar as the predominant reserve currency on the influence on global trade. And that, that is an, a reference to the fact that um, the vast majority of um, contracts, whether they're uh, trade contracts or um, construction contracts or financial uh, contracts, uh, globally are, are denominated in the, perhaps not so much financial contracts, but the others denominated in the US dollar. Will that happen? Uh, well, I think the slide answers that question. Um, not realistically now. And uh, there's the issue of capital controls in China as well. So uh, let me now uh, reach my conclusion. Whilst money has always been political, the immense economic and geopolitical soft power that goes with the reserve currency status of the US dollar does not have a precedent in history, not even sterling at its height. In my view, the crown currently doesn't seem unduly threatened, but there are signs that that hegemony may be fraying. Some other points that uh, I made earlier. Whilst money has always been a social phenomenon, the technology is now powerfully amplifying this in ways that has never happened before. As I put it, from red packets to getting on the metro to buying a cup of coffee, payment by phone or face, increasingly becomes part of the experience. Mobile technology has produced what I've called the democratization of money, and this is happening worldwide. 
a technological generation has effectively been jumped in many parts of the world, Kenya comes to mind with enormous potential gains. This has been immensely speeded up by the 2020 pandemic. The monetary creation that is happening in a number of countries on a, an unprecedented scale may dilute money in the sense of debasing the coinage as used to happen of old, but it will not change the nature of money. To the question, will there be a global currency? The answer may be not yet, but it would be rash to predict what the position may be in a few years time. And then this is how I'd like to close. To all the technological benefits, there is a more problematic side. Will the many benefits that the payments revolution can bring be a marker on the road to the surveillance society? And that, in the end, depends on society's choices. And those choices cannot and should not be ignored. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hey, thank you very much, Bill, for this extremely insightful and interesting presentation. And I will, as I said at the beginning of the webinar, I will open the Q&A after I say first a few comments of my own. And I have seen that in the chat room, our alumni, former students who now have very distinguished positions in many areas relating to the broad spectrum of fintech, they have been active asking questions either privately or to the, or, or to all, to, which is in this case to you. I'd like first uh, just to make three very brief comments. First, on the differences between the common law and the civil law jurisdictions when it comes to the definition and treatment of money. Since many of our students come from a variety of some common law and some civil law, and the treatment, as you very well point in the article which accompanies your presentation and which I will make available to anyone that has listened today, clearly. Uh, points out. Secondly, I'd like to make a couple of comments on the nature of central bank digital currencies. And thirdly, on the issue that you mentioned towards the end, which I know that is dear to you and also to me, which is the issue of financial inclusion. So as, as you point in the presentation and also in the paper, the common law approach and the civil law approach to the definition of money is different. While uh, let's put the UK as a common law jurisdiction since the US in this is idiosyncratic as you mentioned with regard to the Uniform Commercial Code. So while in the UK judges have considered legal questions in the context in which they arise and given that such questions as you write in your paper have risen particularly in relation to payments, the function of money as a means of payment has, has received much attention in these jurisdictions. And this commercial pragmatic approach to money-like instruments has led some of our colleagues, including Simon Gleeson, which you point out again in your paper, to question whether a particular instrument, whether a particular instrument is money or not, the determination of that should be something that changes over time. So the fact that something is not money now does not mean that something will not be money in future. In, in civil law jurisdictions, the, the role of the state in the creation of money, lex moneta, has been always emphasized since this case that you cite, the Serbian loans case. Money is a creature of the state, it is fiat money, and it is legal tender. And interestingly, I would say that of the four functions of money in civil law jurisdictions, the function as unit of account and store of value has received a lot of constitutional attention unit of account because everything from a contract to a government budget, you know, is always denominated in a unit of account, which is in the US, the US dollar, in the Euro era, the Euro, in the UK, the pound. And, and also the, the, the role of, of the store of value has been emphasized because of the central bank status and the commitment to price stability, which puts a lot of emphasis on the role of public money and the control of inflation, which should be associated in order to preserve that value. And uh, I mean, for example, Article 128 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union 
very much inheriting the civil law approach, says that the European Central Bank has the exclusive right to authorize the issue of euro bank notes within the Union, and that those notes are the only that will have legal tender within the Union. This, of course, has a great a, a degree, a great series of implications for the advent of cryptocurrencies or crypto assets or virtual currencies. But there is one more thing that I would point out from this difference, contrasting a points between civil law and common law jurisdictions. And that is that in civil law jurisdictions and many scholars coming you know, from countries like Germany, they have focused a lot of their writings and doctrinal treatment. And this can be seen also in the recent judgment of the German Constitutional Court of the 5th of May of 2020 on the public law, on the issue and regulation of money by the state. While more practically in common law jurisdictions such as the UK, you also cited a, a recent case in Singapore, uh, the, the emphasis has been on private law. And in private law, the notion of payment is fundamental. We are celebrating today CCLS. A long time ago, C. Roy Good defined payment as any act accepted in performance of a monetary obligation. So the democratization of payments and the issue of the shadow payments suggests that payment system at about outside the banking system may lead to a different role of the central bank in this regard, and that the approach may be different in common law jurisdictions as in civil law jurisdictions in terms of the evolution, because this is an evolving subject. The, I mean, for example, with regard to payment systems, it's interesting to note that Article 22 of the ECB statute has been interpreted rather narrowly and that the European Central Bank has been advocated for a broader interpretation in order to encompass financial market infrastructures and CCPs, something which after the global financial crisis is part of what the Bank of England does, the supervision of financial market infrastructures, and what the US does in terms of the provision of lender of large resort assistance to FMIs, a list of FMIs. So that's, that was, that's kind of my first comment, question, and, and, and to engage also the audience. The second is the, the nature of central bank digital currencies, bearing in mind that fiat money is an evolving reality, is not a crystallized nature, is not a, a, a crystallized concept. And, and in a way, uh, CBDCs, important as they are, they are not are as a revolutionary idea as the private alternatives such as Bitcoin or Libra have been. I mean, you write in your paper, and I agree, that a, a Nakamoto, whether it's a he or a she, we tend to, to say a he, but we don't know, set out to create an alternative payment system, when in fact what he has created is a highly volatile and a speculative investment. But the original intention was an alternative payment system. Clearly, Libra evolved in the 2019 proposals and in the most recent 2020 of April that you just cited, has, has thrown a whole new range of issues which are creating a degree of discomfort in the central banking community. Because after all, eh, when, when eh, the, the collapse of the Bretton Woods arrangement took place, eh, free banking economies very much following Hayek advocated that we needed also competition in the internal provision of currency. That in the same way as we had a competitive foreign exchange market, what we now needed is competition also in the internal provision of money. And guess what? That's exactly what private virtual currencies like Libra want to do. So I, I would like to put this comment question and, and also to the audience. And then my third point is something which is very dear to, to you and to me and to many in our audience. And that is the question, one of the greatest challenges of our time is financial inclusion and sustainability. Let's focus today on financial inclusion. The sustainability is also related to financial inclusion. So promoting financial inclusion, widen, widening the access to banking and insurance services, both for vulnerable households and to small businesses in developed countries, and using financial technology in low and middle income countries like MPES and Kenya, and I know that some in our audience are dealing with those issues in Kenya, might prove actually quite instrumental in unlocking the opportunities for the very poor of the unbanked. 
And, and this is where we have to, to see the significance of a Libra or a Libra-like competitor. I mean, I have nothing to say that Libra will be the, the, this, this alternative that suggests that the, the, the world of fiat money is experimenting a fundamental change because CBDC is, is not a fundamental change. It's just a digital manifestation of more fiat money. But, but you know, this, this will be perhaps my, my, my question to you before I open the question to the to the general Q&A. Could, could Libra or a Libra-like competitor bill alter fundamentally the world of fiat money and improve financial inclusion? You mentioned how remittances by migrant workers are subject to high transfer fees. And you know whether a social media company such as Facebook that allows us to transmit pictures and all sorts of things can improve the life of migrant workers and the families of those workers back in their home countries is an open question. So with this uh, question, I will open generally the Q&A, but I will ask you, Bill, to obviously react to any of my comments, thanking you very much for this insightful presentation, but perhaps in particular to talk to the issue of financial inclusion, which I know already from many questions in the in the in the chat room privately some of them and some of them publicly i'm getting so thank you bill and if you want to unmute yourself that will be the first question coming opportunity to react well thank you very much rosa and i agree with what you've said uh, on all three but uh, just very briefly on financial inclusion yes it does have um, very important repercussions we, we will see shortly whether uh, in Brazil, the experiment that I mentioned earlier is, is successful or not. Um, but uh, it, if you uh, t take the point that uh, you make payments re really as easy as we're, we're used to communicating and you're simply adding on a payment to uh, a message, then the implications of that are, are, uh, are very great. But of course, um, it may be that uh, Libra will produce a response, it probably is already. And uh, it doesn't follow that uh, just because Libra doesn't get off the ground perhaps or doesn't succeed, that uh, the uh, impact that this has had won't be beneficial in the long run. Sorry, thank you very much. And uh, I, I know there was a question from Katrien. So Katrien, if you want to put, you unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask the question. Thanks, Rosa, and thanks very much, uh, Bill, for, for the excellent uh, presentation. It's very insightful. Um, so I'm a lecturer in banking and finance law at CCLS, so um, I'm very happy um, with this event, and I, I'm, I'm very keen that you could join as a guest speaker as well. And I think uh, your connections that you draw between finance, tech, social media, and, and, and the law, obviously, uh, are very insightful uh, and are things to, to think about carrying forward. Um, I have one particular question I wanted to uh, ask you about. Um, so uh, you talked about Libra and Facebook Libras, um, and I was wondering uh, what problems do you see uh, from, from a, a monetary policy perspective with these types of, of digital money? Uh, you mentioned specifically sort of that original feature of, of Libra was um, that the value was linked to the to sort of the weighted value of, of five currencies, um, and, and I don't know, sort of had a red flag in my in my head uh, from a monetary policy perspective. So I, I wanted to um, put that question to you, and thanks again for for the uh, really insightful presentation. Well, thank you very much, Katrien. And uh, yes, I think that one of the reasons for the uh, the, the, the headwind that uh, Libra has undoubtedly faced um, has been the, the very concerns you mentioned, concerns as to um, uh, monetary policy. And uh, it is important to, uh, to take that into uh, account. My, my feeling, I have to say, um, is, is, is a somewhat pragmatic one. Uh, I, I just ask myself a simple question. Um, we've seen technology as a kind of tidal wave. There's, there's been very little we can do about it, and many people feel, you know, 
threatened in, in many ways. But whether it's good or bad, the technology, I, I believe, is going to uh, come through on this. And I think the implications for um, monetary policy uh, are something that authorities and countries are going to have to cope with, but I think they will. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katrien. We have a question here from one of our uh, students who, who came to London to do a master's and who's actually considering doing a PhD and he comes from Kenya and is Joseph Jitao. And so uh, uh, if you can give a, a CCLS events, if you can unmute Jitao Moburu and give him the opportunity to put his question to Bill. And it's lovely to see you. And I hope that you know your plans to do the PhD with us remain alive despite the, the, the coronavirus complications. So the floor is yours, both to introduce yourself and to put the question to Bill. Um, thank you, Professor Lastra. It's good to see everyone. My name is Gitamburu. Um, I finished my LLM in law and economics. Um, in 2018, uh, and it was an absolute uh, thrill and good pleasure to, to study at CCLS. Um, I've got one quick question and a comment. Let me start with a comment. Um, on the last round of discussions that uh, um, Sal Blair, you, you had with Professor Lastra on uh, financial inclusion, I mean, most of you will know uh, Kenya's transformation or journey on financial inclusion. Uh, there are many things to say. About about it. Uh, I think the one main point that I would want to put across for the benefit of people in this uh, call is what countries like Kenya have quickly realized is often the discussion on financial inclusion begins from a quantity perspective. Obviously for developing and emerging economies, it's quite important to get as many people who are not covered by bank accounts, who are unable to do basic payments, to be included in the formal financial system. So the discussion and policies and support on financial inclusion often begins from a quantity perspective. Let's cover as many people as possible. But quickly that discussion uh, transitions to elements around quality. So the quality of that financial inclusion. And by that, I mean topics that are obviously important from a policy and regulatory perspective, like the safety, uh, making sure that people are being included in a financial system where safety is guaranteed, where confidence is guaranteed, where the cost and affordability of financial and payment services is, is, is good, uh, where there's trust and obviously on a wider uh, micro and macro potential elements like uh, AML uh, and, and financial stability. So it's, it's one learning journey that I'm sure many other countries across African emerging economies have seen from a uh, financial inclusion focus on quantity to various elements on quality. The quick question I have for the speaker today is uh, very brief. I'll, I'll give you my own nomenclature around uh, the challenges facing uh, authorities when it comes to fintech and financial services and, and possibly on payments. So, and I call this model around the, the three Ps. Often the touch point of regulation is usually the provider. So regulation is all about placing particular obligations on providers to behave and interact in a particular way in the market. Or we also place touch points or obligations on products or like payment products or thirdly on platforms, such as what is happening on the examples you've given in China. So provider, platform and product. And I think the ex existential question facing regulators and authority is how to mix what will be the touch point of regulation when it comes to those three touch points, if you are to think of them as a pyramid. Should we continue placing obligations on providers even when they are uh, acting in a very fast moving world? Should the touch point be on provider, on uh, platforms, underlying technology, uh, and that changes very quickly, or should it be on products to make sure that they are safe uh, for, for the public to use? So I'd, 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 I'd really appreciate a comment from the speaker on that, and thank you very much for this uh, uh, very interesting and illuminating call. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill, would you like to answer briefly? Yes, I would, but uh, Gita, thank you very much for your question, and um, uh, you're quite right that um, of course, M-Pesa in Kenya has uh, um, uh, now for, I, I forget how many years, 10, 15 years or possibly even more, uh, attached to mobile technology, the uh, ability to uh, make payments. I think the, the, uh, you're right that the, um, that the emphasis needs to be on 
quality as well as quantity. I think that's totally correct. Um, on the three uh, questions you, you put, uh, or the, the points that supervisors need to focus on, I, I would say they need to focus on all of them. The, uh, the, the, the real question, I think, for the future is how far the technology changes the structure of finance. And we don't fully know the answer to that yet. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have uh, two last questions, and then with that, I will finish with some uh, finishing remarks. First, there was a question from Liliana Rodriguez from Colombia. And it was a question, uh, uh, if you want to unmute uh, CCL events, Liliana Rodriguez, she had a question about concerns about privacy. And then the other question was from Ziru from China. And he had a question about the shadow banking brought by Alipay and WeChat. So first, I, I suggest for the benefit of time that we first hear what Liliana has to say then we listen to Ziru, and then we give Bill the opportunity to answer before I close the event. So Liliana, lovely seeing you. It's very nice to see you. Uh, I am very excited to be here. Thank you very much for the wonderful event. Uh, there, these are very valuable topics. Uh, well, I have a question that uh, refers to uh, the issue of privacy. Uh, I uh, have seen that uh, when we are using uh, electronic uh, devices like credit cards uh, and uh, because of the different regimes regarding data uh, around the world, uh, then uh, this uh, creates uh, like uh, certain uh, patterns and profiles on uh, the way that uh, these devices are used. So um, I would uh, like to know from your perspective uh, how uh, would this kind of issue be addressed by policies or in an eventual creation of a virtual currency? Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Lovely seeing you, Liliana. So now we'll take the question from Ziru. See if you can't again events, CCL events, unmute Ziru so that he can put his question to, to Sir William Blair. Hello, hi Professor. I'm Zhu from Beijing, China. And my thank you very much for this excellent presentation. And my question is, could you please share some of your views on sorry? Uh, we have lost you, Ziru, if if you want to, to, to say the question again. Yeah, uh, so my question is, could you please share some of your views on how to address the problem of shadow banking brought by Alipay and WeChat Pay? Because we know they also kind of sell funds and they make loans, they take deposits, doing like the commercial banks do. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Bill, if you would like to take these two questions, please. Unmute yourself. Well, they're both excellent questions and thank you for them. Um, let me start with you, uh, Liliana. Uh, you're, you're quite right. I mean, the, the, um, the uh, tra what I think I described as the trail that we leave in our lives um, is, is, is not that old, but it's, uh, it's, it's certainly um, not that new either. Uh, you, you, gave the obvious example with credit cards, but re remember that that is all uh, split up between different companies. Uh, Ma MasterCard and Visa, for example, actually are, are collections of um, banks which are um, uh, um, in, operating in different countries. So it, it's, not a, it's not monolithic in that way. But where I think uh, is a, a, a real game changer that we all have to um, think very, very carefully about um, is both the the great the great uh, benefits that AI may bring, but also for the first time the fact that enormous amounts of uh, information can, can not only be uh, brought together and processed, but and this is this is the new point that conclusions and deductions can be made from uh, that data. And so, so that's why um, 
uh, Liliana um, expressed those 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 uh, views, and thank you for uh, highlighting that. Uh, Giroud, um, th uh, thank you very much for your uh, question. And um, China's made a big contribution uh, in the field of payments. It's it's been a, a head in many many ways, and I um, uh, greatly respect the um, uh, progress that you've made. On your specific question on shadow banking, uh, in a sense, that's a, 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 a policy issue. Um, we, we know that shadow banking is an a, a important feature of China's um, financial landscape. Uh, but per, per, perhaps just though on payments and uh, uh, Alipay and um, uh, the, 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 the Tencent system, uh, the, there is now, as I understand it, through the People's Bank of China, which of course is China's central bank, uh, there is a there is clearing. Uh, so that so the clearing now goes through the PBOC. Now uh, I don't, I'm afraid, know how um, granular that is, but certainly the the fact that 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 is happening um, implies that the central bank and and therefore. Uh, 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 policy, policy uh, proper poli uh, uh, the, the proper application of policy um, may may become um, uh, simpler to do. So th that's how I answer your question. And again, thank you for it. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, there are many other questions. I'm just seeing a question from my dear friend and student Marcelo. Do you see a risk of a Big Brother or surveillance state if cash is eliminated? But we do not have time to answer more questions because our order to give place to the next set of events that are celebrated in other areas of law at CCLS today. So I am just going to say a few final remarks and, and I will start again by thanking our distinguished speaker for all the work that he has done in order to prepare his presentation today and all is for his enthusiasm in being as as a, as a professor of financial law and ethics, uh, a, a great supporter of all our CCLS activities. We, we are very privileged to have Sir William Blair as a colleague and friend. Let me also add a few words of thanks to Carlos Cavallo, who has been always very instrumental in helping both Bill and myself in all projects concerning financial inclusion. Also to Clara Barbiani, who helped, as, as Carlos said, to put together the presentation, which was an excellent presentation also from a technical standpoint. To Christine and our events team, which have been following up and ensuring that everyone could do a, a, a could, could listen to the webinar today, connecting from time zones and from continents. And then also to our alumni team who have been very active in ensuring that everyone could be reached out. And this is also a call for alumni. Please extend the word of CCLS and our themes. And I am just going to put again in, in, the, in the chat room to everyone, two projects which I'm doing at the moment, which one has to do with a sovereign debt forum. And, and if you press on the link, you will see more. And one has to do with the subject of today, the legal and economic conception of money, a project in which I'm principal investigator and in which we look at many of the issues that Professor Blair has discussed today. So please look into that and, and, and keep in touch. And uh, last but not least, I must thank Katrien. See, Katrien Morve, who has one of the questions and who has joined CCLS as one of our uh, youngest uh, in terms of, of, of most recent uh, uh, people that have joined banking and finance. She helped organize the event and, uh, and she, she had also the, the idea of both selecting, uh, inviting uh, Bill for us, a friend, Sir William Blair, and also of, of agreeing with, with the theme. And, and, and it can be seen from the perspective of all the questions that we have received so far that this is really a very important subject. My final comment has nothing to do with, uh, well, has something to do. It has to do a reflection of COVID. It is because of physically today. Many of you have, have made plans and even travel arrangements. To, and, and we're very grateful for, for that, for those plans and that commitment, that alumni uh, uh, loyalty, which we treasure very much. And just to say that, that really financial inclusion is very much related to 
one of the calls for help that has been done by both the, the managing director of the IMF and the World Bank president, David Malpass, who said um, a few days ago that billions of people will have their livelihoods affected by the pandemic. And many people, 60 million, could be pushed into extreme poverty. poverty. And that this uh, Georgina, sorry, Kristalina Georgieva had said that this is a truly global crisis like no other. So clearly the issues of the future of technology, the use of technology we are meeting today virtually, and the issues of financial inclusion are very much the flavor of the day also in the context of the dire circumstances that many in our countries are living. So with that final reflection and a thanks to all our wonderful alumni for joining us today, please stay in touch. Please keep your love for CCLS as you're telling me in your chat room alive. And I will now do a virtual clap to Bill Blair. So allow me to say thank you very much, Bill. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.